Good morning, everybody. Um, if you all want to unmute for a moment just to say hi, we can do that and then you mute yourselves again. Hi. Morning. Hello, everybody. Morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. Oh, I hear you all. <laughs> Could you all mute yourselves again, please, and we will start our service. Um, this is a little bit different because here we are at the Jackson Community Church and not at the Jackson Community Church. Um, Reverend Gail is on vacation. This is her second week and she will be back next Sunday. Today we have um, Reverend Canon Dan Weir. Can you wave, Dan? Um, who will be preaching for us. We're really grateful for that. Um, worship here, most of you I think have been here before. You'll know that it's different from our usual, but um, we're all still gathered. If you arrived just a few moments ago, I was realizing um, since I tuned in quite early today that if you tune in, you don't really have to get out of your pajamas, but you can listen to 15 minutes of wonderful music with Alan Labrie without even having to leave the comfort of your home. And that's kind of nice. We don't get that much um, quiet to, to listen to him that way normally. So anyway, um, you might want to tune in early another week to get to hear Alan do that. First of all, we have um, Dan Weir, as I introduced Reverend Weir. Jeanette Heideman has been the wizard behind and in front of the screen for the last two weeks, doing a fantastic job getting us all organized on Facebook and setting up the meetings and everything. Um, the deacons have been helping with the various services that we have. And Alan Labrie is providing wonderful music before the service and during the service and a post loop. And um, we have Billy Carlton who's been leading the choir every Sunday. So I have a few community announcements. And after I finish the list that we have, I'd appreciate you unmuting yourself if you have another announcement for the life of the church and the community. First of all, uh, we have an eight o'clock gathering at the pavilion uh, behind the community center every Sunday. We have a 915 in-person worship in the sanctuary if you are interested in coming to that. There isn't any um, singing and it's a briefer service. People are very socially distanced with pews blocked off and so forth. So we feel as it's as safe an environment as we can produce if you would like to come to church in person. And then of course, we still have our 1030 service here via Zoom. Um, choir is usually every Sunday, but we are taking a week off next Sunday, which is over Labor Day weekend. So choir, choir will resume at nine o'clock, two Sundays from now. If you are singing in the statewide um, uh, choir performance for the UCC, the last rehearsal is at two o'clock from two to three this afternoon. And um, we also have an upcoming Alzheimer's walk, which at this point is planned for Wednesday, September 9th. Jeanette is helping to organize that. And if you want to participate, she will be sending, or the church will be sending out an email or two between now and the 9th to tell you when and where. But your donations to her Alzheimer's walk um, are most welcome anytime. Does anybody else have announcements for the life of the church? Dan? Yeah, just a, a, another announcement about the Friends of the Jackson Public Library. We had a wonderful concert last week with our local harpist, Dominic Dodge, but I just want to announce on the same day as the Alzheimer's Walk, which is the 9th of September, the Friends of the Jackson Library will be having a, its annual meeting, which should have been held in March, but wasn't for obvious reasons, uh, in on the lawn behind the library. So anybody who supports the Jackson Public Library is a member of the Friends by, by right. And uh, Tom Pizer and I are members of the, uh, the board, but we want as many Friends of the Jackson Public Library to show up at the library at 10 o'clock on the Wednesday, the 9th of September. Thank you. Any other announcements, Jeanette? Dan, if you could let Alan know, I the wizard behind the curtain mistakenly muted Alan. Thank you. Is there anybody else who has an announcement? Okay. If not, would you please all make sure that you are muted and we will listen to Alan 
uh, play some centering music for us, as if we can unmute him. <laughs> yeah. We're unmuted. <laughs> We're good. We're okay. unmuted. All right. Alan, Alan, you're up. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good to see so many of you on my screen. And uh, after the last week, I looked at myself standing too close to my computer and decided to move so you can actually see the cross behind me. And I hope you can all hear me. I want to begin before we pray with uh, a psalm that I found very much a part of my life in a slightly different translation. A reminder to us as we begin worship, as we come together to pray. Uh, in whose presence we are praying. And this is a translation of Psalm 100, uh, known in uh, Anglican circles and in, I guess, Latin, in, in Latin, Latin Jubilate Deo. May all lands be joyful before you, O God. Serve you with gladness and come before your presence with a song. For we know that you are God. You yourself have made us and we are yours. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. We shall enter your gates with thanksgiving, go into your courts with praise, give thanks to you and call upon your name. For you are good, your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. We're going to lift up our prayers to God this morning, and I'm going to ask our deacon of the day, and it goes to Lead us to the beginning by uh, reading the names of those we already know are in need of our prayers. We'll begin with our concerns to say. Uh, so, uh, Meg, who are those people this congregation has been concerned about and continues to be concerned about? Um, we lift up in prayer those who are about to undergo, undergoing and have undergone or recovering from surgery and other procedures, Cheryl, Judy, Deanna, Sasha, Jim, Lee, Kate, and other people needing care for their hips and shoulders and spines and wrists and replacements and joints and eyes and ears. Um, those living with cancer, um, Cheryl, Claire, Roy and Nancy's daughter, other people who have new or ongoing diagnoses who don't wish to be named yet, but we want to pray for all of them. Uh, those living with changed and life-altering conditions. We pray for Barry Brodel and his wife, Jan. Those who are mourning, all those who've been lost to COVID-19 and the challenges for their families. Uh, we pray for our emergency responders and frontline workers. We pray for the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutari in Zimbabwe. We pray for the two villages, particularly in Honduras, that we deal with on Honduras Hope, Plan Grande and San Jose. And we pray for the victims of uh, the natural disasters that have been taking place this week, the hurricanes and storms and fires. 
that have impacted so many people. Are there other people with prayer concerns? I have prayers. This is Kevin. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, prayer for Reverend Gail and Chris. And for a nice man I met, Tom, who has tremors in his hand, prayer for his tremors. And his wife, Judith, is having surgery on her vertebrate in the back of her neck, and she has a growth on her neck. Prayer for her. And prayer for Polly, a nice lady I met. Um, her daughter has cerebral palsy. And prayer for B.J. Parker, who's trying to raise funds to get um, gas cards and laundry cards for the way station. So, and prayer for me. Um, I'd, I'd like to lift up, um, as, I'm, as many of you know, um, I also play at Our Lady of the Mountains and our pastor um, is taking an extended leave of absence um, due to helping out his parents um, with their medical conditions. Uh, obviously we have another pastor covering while he is on leave of absence. So I would ask for uh, prayers for our pastor over there while he's on leave. Thank you. Anybody else? Are there any joys and celebrations that people want to mention this week? I want to give thanks uh, for our presence of our daughter, her two children, and uh, their two dogs with us this weekend. It's really great to have family with us for a little bit. I have a joy, Megan. Reverend, okay. <laughs> um, I have joy that it's a sunny day and it's a beautiful day and very grateful and that I was able to pick some wildfire, wildflowers for um, Tom's wife, Judith, and for uh, Christine and Polly, and I gave them to him. So I'm grateful for all that. Thanks, Kevin. Is there anybody else? Dan? If not, then we will turn this over to Reverend Dan Weir to lead us in prayer. All right. Now, if you want to unmute yourself and hear the kind of talk on this thing of us praying together out loud, you feel free to do that. Our prayers reach out no matter how we, uh, confused we may seem. As Paul says, uh, the spirit moves with sides to be for words. We pray together in the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the kingdom, power, power and, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us open our hearts and our ears to hear the word of God in Scripture this morning. Today's Scripture is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, verses chapter 12 verses 9 to 21 let love be genuine hate what is evil hold fast to what is good love one another with mutual affection outdo one another in showing honor do not lag in zeal be ardent in spirit serve the lord rejoice in hope be patient in suffering persevere in prayer Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be claimed to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. 
but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So ends the reading. May our thinking and our speaking be all of this to your praise and glory, O God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some years ago in a congregation I served in central Massachusetts, I had the idea of talking about the church as a school. Uh, not in the sense of learning about the Bible, although that's an important part of it, or even about learning how to pray more, okay? pray more deeply, and that's part of it. But learning how to live together in community so that we would be formed to live out in the world a different kind of life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once wrote that at baptism, there's a breach created between us and the world. And we sometimes treat that as being we're better than them. No, we're not. We are like them sinners, redeemed by God's love. And we need to be aware of that calling to be a community set apart, gathered together to live together, but also to live in the world. And what I try to do there and what I keep on trying to do in my daily walk with God is to use those opportunities in relationship with one another to learn how to live better out in the world. I remember a young woman that was a, a teenager from uh, Western New York where I moved after I left Massachusetts. She had gone to an Episcopal youth event and she said she was very embarrassed. She told me about this afterwards. It's a national event and she was very embarrassed that she was in a gathering that was so close in ways that we are not allowed to be close, at least not safely these days, that she ended up stepping on the foot of the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. And she was amazed. You know, he's not called an archbishop, but he's pretty close. And I said to her, don't be guilty about that. That happens because you were close enough to step on, her, on his foot. We learn in community how to treat one another when we're that close. The challenges of living that way in community help us to live more that way out in the world. Uh, Paul speaks of this in Romans. It's follow up on what was the text last week about not being conformed to the world or squeezed into the world's mold. He speaks about it when he says, let love be genuine. Love one another with genuine love, reflecting God's love to us, to others. Hate what is evil, hold fast that which is good. Love one another with mutual affection. I've learned over the years, if I treat other people with love, even if I don't particularly like them, I learn to like them a bit more. And then he says, do not lag in, in zeal, but be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. We do this together in order that together as a community, we might show God's love out in the world. So it really is a school for life, the church, the way we deal with one another. In the last congregation I served in Massachusetts before I moved to Buffalo, uh, there were some really wonderful people in that parish. Uh, one of them uh, named Nancy had become an been Episcopalian as a child and she did not go to church much until one day her teenage boy said, came home from school and said, mom, what's a Bible? And she realized that he'd seen the word Bible, but didn't know what it was. And she said, well, I learned what a Bible was when I was a child by going to church. 
And so Ted and Nancy and their two children came to church. And another person who came to church around the same time because of a friendship with Nancy was a woman named Mary Lou. And Mary Lou and her husband and their two children, uh, all of, I, I baptized both the children and the husband who was a, ra raised as a secular Jew. And one day, Mary Lou had come, been around long enough to be elected to our vestry, our parish board. And she said to me after her first couple of meetings, she said, Dan, I don't like you as much at the board meetings as I do on Sunday morning. What she discovered was that sometimes <clears throat> in my role of leadership in the community, I had to speak in ways that were not quite as comforting, quite as affirming, sometimes very challenging ways. One of the things we did on that board was to try to reach consensus about issues. I had, lived, had been for a while a Quaker in my teens and I understood about the sense of the meeting, which doesn't mean unanimity, it means making a decision that everyone can live with. And one of our members, who was relatively new, he came to church uh, because he wanted to do a Sunday dinner program uh, for the church, for anybody in the community. And we ran a Sunday dinner program every week. Uh, we used a nice church china. We had servers to bring food to folks. Nobody waited in line. And it was a wonderful program. And we wanted to do something. He, there was something else that was asked of us that had to do with signs, signs outside the building. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> He didn't like the idea. We didn't like the extra sign that we wanted to add. And we went through a long discussion of that on our vestry meeting. And at the end of it, it was quite clear that everybody except this man was in agreement. And we tried to convince him, to persuade him to join us. And at one point he finally sort of held up his hand and said, stop, you're not gonna persuade me that this is the right choice, but I can live with it, so go ahead. That's good Quaker decision. He could live with it. It wasn't going to make him leave the church or stop doing what he was doing. That particular man did something for us that we would not have done without him, I think. He helped us learn about hospitality, which is something that also Paul says. When he talks about all of the things we do to one another, he then challenges the church to practice hospitality. We had lots of people come to the Sunday dinner program at all. Holy Trinity Church. And one particular family came for several weeks before one of our servers spoke to them about something else. they have been coming. It's a woman uh, who was not particularly rich and had a six children, maybe seven children, I can't remember the number. And if you looked at the last names of those children, you knew that given the variety of last names that she'd had a very checkered past. But she came to church to eat and her children came with her. And Shirley, who was one of the Sunday school teachers who also volunteered as a server, came up to her after dinner one Sunday and said, you know, you could come to church at nine for church school and then stay for worship at 10. And she did. She began coming to church. And the following Easter, when we were preparing to baptize some children at the Easter Eve service on Saturday evening, she and six of her children were baptized. The oldest, this teenager, didn't want to be baptized. And that was okay. There were so many children and adults being baptized that day that I sometimes lost count. And I sometimes had to say, who's next? Because I didn't know. Couldn't keep track of them all. And I had to make sure I got the names right. But the community had practiced hospitality and brought a family that needed to know God's love into the fellowship of the church. That's an important work that we do. Practicing hospitality, learning how to love one another. Uh, there was another member of that family, uh, not that family, that parish that was very dear to me and still is many years after. I left that place in, in uh, 1988. It's been a long time since I was there, except for a visit last year when I learned that one of the members of a family that had long time been active and then inactive but became active again, a woman named Hope had come back to church. She came back, I think, because she, was, she had a baby. I visited her in the hospital. I baptized the baby. I then did the wedding for the father and mother. They were not married when the child was born. And at least one of the older members of the church said, well, you know, that Conrad crowd, that family, they'll never amount to much. 
And what ended up happening is that hope not only amounted to a great deal in that parish, she kept on inviting other people in. And so we had this wonderful crowd of young married couples and hope would say to them, well, don't do it for yourself necessarily, but do it for your children who need to know that God loves them. They need that. And so one day I was visiting Hope's mother, who was a bit of a cantankerous, difficult person. I went to see her. And as soon as I walked in the door of her apartment, she lashed out at me. I had not been there in a while. And she was angry that I had ignored her. She understood something about love, but she uh, got a little screwed up about that. And she got angry with me because I hadn't been there as often as she wanted me to be there. She thought it was owed her. And of course she was right. I owed her the love that God had shared with me. And for a moment I got so angry with her that I almost left the room. I almost walked out the door, but she persevered in relationship in a way that needed, I needed to understand that she said, no, don't leave, it's okay. See, like so many other people, I gave my love conditionally sometimes. I expected to be thanked. I expected to be praised. I expected to be given a reward for what I did. And I was gonna be angry because I wasn't getting thanks. God wants us to love unconditionally. To love without looking for a thank you or, or a reward or any acknowledgement of what we do. In every congregation, you can find some people who do that, who don't want the thanks, who don't want the adulation, who just keep on giving themselves over and over again. And they, became a, they become for us, I think, icons of God to think this is the way God loves us, that God loves us while we were yet sinners. God loves us even if we don't return that love. God certainly wants us to return that love because returning that love to God is a natural thing for us to do if we've experienced that love, but not only to turn it back to God, but to return it by living, loving others, loving others as we go through the day. So it's in the community of the church that we learn that when we get close enough that we might hurt one another, step on one another's foot, that we learn how to forgive and receive forgiveness, how to love and receive love, how to be open to God's unconditional love for us, and to love reflecting God's love out into the world. One of the prayer insights I got some years ago was that one of the first ways to deal with those moments when I'm being challenged is to recollect, to collect myself again into the presence of God and to remember how much God loves me, how God's love for me has been shown. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die upon the cross to show us God's love. And when I recollect that, when I remember that, when I practice what uh, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection used to call the presence of God, when I practice that presence, knowing myself to be loved by God, then it becomes possible, not easy necessarily, but possible for me to pray that prayer we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not my kingdom. But thy kingdom, not my will, but thy will. Or the prayer as Jesus prayed it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will, Father. As much as I might want to run away from this challenge, my commitment is to do God's will. The wonderful author of a Wrinkle in Time, Madeline Lingle wrote in one of her books that hell, whether here or forever, comes when we insist on having our own way, consist on having our will done in the world rather than God's will. Heaven, whether we experience it here and now or in what one of my friends called uh, the sweet by and by, 
that is comes to us when we will to do God's will. When we can get off the throne of our heart and let God be enthroned as the Lord of our lives, the rock of our salvation. That's the call we have. And I know in this community, as in so many other communities here in the Valley, and in communities across the country during this pandemic, our life together in community has shaped us to go into the world, giving of ourselves, giving of our goods, our treasure, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to shelter the homeless, to help those in need. That's what happens when God's love forms us in community to be the body of Christ in the world. Amen. We now want to uh, remember that as we are the body of Christ, as we are a church in this community, we are called to give of ourselves in our time and our talents and our goods of the world. Uh, we would appreciate all the offerings that you can make either by dropping things off, money off at the church, contributing to the food pantry and the way station, sending in your donation by mail, um, or contributing online. This church continues to operate in a very different way, but it is still operating and active um, in our community and the greater community, and whatever you can do to help that is most appreciated. Thanks. And now we're gonna have Alan come back to the piano and we hope unmute himself and offer us and play the benediction for us. You can mute or unmute as you wish and sing our very familiar benediction. Alan is unmuted. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Amen. Um, now you can unmute yourselves and we'll have our virtual coffee hour. And boy, I can't wait till we have those goodies in church someday. But meanwhile, <laughs> we can all talk and we're really good at that. <laughs> Thanks for being here, everybody. Thank you, Meg and Alan. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.